Okay. Hi there. Here we are again. We're carrying on with the realistic worldview. And typically, in the context of teaching people how to open their minds and to find real happiness, we spend a lot of time talking about how they're not open and how miserable we are. But that's very important because we have to we have to see the situation honestly and face the facts. Really, they're not noble truths. They're friendly, fun facts. And then we will be able to improve the facts, you know, and we'll come up with better facts. That's what we're doing. So wisdom is bliss, ignorance, not so much. Luckily, luckily, it's to experience reality as suffering is just a mistake. Born of our wrong knowing. The opposite of the realistic worldview. So we think we're just stuck this way and we'll always be that way and we're separate from everything else and we may not even be in the world, we may not even exist. And all. We have all these fears, we're told actually, as a way out that we don't really exist so we don't really have to worry about it. That's what the scientists tell us. The religious people tell us that we don't really, we're not really real in this fleshly body, impure fleshly body and God or Buddha or somebody is going to take us out of this body in some heavenly place just by dying, so, uh, but we're, and therefore we're supposed to stay miserable in life, and that's also wrong. So that where nothing is wrong and that we're supposed to be miserable is wrong, according to Buddha's discovery, his earth-breaking scientific discovery, achieved by observation, by experiment, by experiential realization of, of the nature of, rea of being one with reality and knowing it what it is by being it fully. And, uh, and that's really interesting. So, so anyway, when, when we misknow it, then we're messed up. Such deluded experience is not real reality where we think we're separate from everything. It's an unreal reality. It's a reality in that we've experienced things that way, like I'm the one and nobody else agrees with me and I can't get everything I want all the time and I keep getting what I don't want. All this kind of suffering. You know. It is illusory. It's unreal. Luckily, it has an unreal quality. It is illusory. Reality, the reality of it all is bliss freedom, indivisible. That, that actually there is this bliss of not being that. No. <laughs> really. It's like, you know, you see yourself in the mirror and uh, you know you, it's not some person through a window on the other side of the mirror. You know that that's an illusion, that, and you see yourself looking all miserable. But actually, the reflection is not miserable at all. The reflection is just a reflection. It's illusory. But I think I'm the real thing, and so I really am miserable, I think. But in one way, I'm a reflection of my misknowledge already. I'm, I'm misknowing myself, whereas I'm actually just a mirror reflection of habits, but I'm misknowing as if that's the absolute thing, the way I feel I am. All right? So that's my deluded experience, but it's, it's an unreal reality. It's illusory. Reality is bliss, freedom, indivisible. Free of the illusion of a, the freedom is the, is the mirror surface, and the bliss is the joy of being on it. Free of the illusion of the alienated self. You know with mind and body, physically you know it too, that you have always been sheer freedom, which you have either suffered or enjoyed as a, mo a holy, relational, loving, selfless self. <laughs> right? You suffer it when you think you're just an absolute and nobody's taking you absolutely seriously. You enjoy it when you realize you're relational and that therefore you're completely interconnected and you become loving and you become in a way, self-transcending and self-opening at all times, and then you become really, you melt into it and you become happy. When you fully experience the nature of the world, no longer separating yourself from all the other, i.e. the, the not-you world around you, you find real bliss, and you never again really suffer. So, the Buddha, so that's the buddhasmic experience, which is truly realistic. So when you're in super orgasm, in the sense of not the ejaculative ending of it, but the height of it, where you're melting out of being able to hold on to anything, that bliss experience prolonged in everything as the, as the overriding tone of everything. That's the enlightened being, while still being completely present. 
but seeing it like mirror reflection. You ref everything is reflected in the mirror surface of your bliss, and your freedom, and therefore you're in bliss at all time, although you can be completely engaged with other beings' sufferings, even empathetically feel them, like you can do look very carefully in the mirror and you can see some flaw in your cheekbone or something, something to pick at. You can see it very clearly, even though you know that, that what you're looking at there is not it. Since Buddhism is realism, the Buddha's enlightenment discovery is that of the true nature of reality and thus is a scientific discovery. Now, for you to really get the impact of that, because you know what? We really believe when the scientist says, oh, yeah, we, we evolved from dinosaurs or something. Or, oh, yeah, this, this, this is still happening and that is happening. We're impressed. And, oh, there's a bomb just went off, you know. When, when we, we feel that, so we feel that they're confirming you know, because they are, they're describing what we think we're seeing, you see. So similarly, when you have that experience and you really become more self-aware about when you feel really well and at one with life, then you'll realize that you already have somewhere that feeling of well-being and that feeling of all goodness. We all have that blissful feeling somewhere. Therefore, when we're miserable, we're always comparing with the feeling of letting go and floating, you know, in warm in the in the hot bath, you know. Since Buddhism is realism, Buddhism enlightenment discovery that of a true story is science. Therefore, scientific discovery is something we can compare with, with with scientific errors and with illusions and delusions. So, something real is discovered, we then accept it. You know, this is really important. We are all completely hypnotized by scientism, by materialistic scientism, that they know everything, and they assure us, and they do this documentary showing that rock bounced over here, and that created the other thing, and Big Bang started the whole thing even, and they, then now they're in, into 97% of it they never can see. So they're just beginning to look at that, but they don't see it, but they know it's there, ha ha. It is not a mystical, so it's a scientific, it's not a mystical, otherworldly experience, though it, it ends up being out of this world, great. Unworldly great, it, rem it remains. It is the full experience of this real world. Here we need to talk a bit more about the physical discoveries Buddha made that are the source of his teachings. Buddha made the most extreme effort to penetrate to an experimental, i.e. experiential insight into the deepest, most ultimate, quote-unquote, absolute, if you will, nature of physical reality. He put his life on the line to do so. That is to say, he faced death and kept his cool, kept his realistic awareness. He thereby discovered what he called the clear light of the void, or the transparency of the void. Not dark, it's just transparent. It's light and dark. The peaceful, inexhaustibly vibrant, yet quiescent energy plenum of emptiness or voidness, which is not really a foundational or underlying reality. Rather, it is the very actuality of reality. The matrix of all the differentiated things, each and all relationally present, because void, empty, free of any non-relative component or essence. So this is really key. It isn't like we're saying that this, there's some underlying place of just open space between me and the screen and you and the future and the time difference and the whatever it is when you listen to this. It, that, that's not it. The clear light is all of it equal, even in its formulation as a screen and a person and a seemingly separate thing and air in between them that seems to be empty of anything other than air open space and so forth, dark space between us and the stars and so on. All of that, the dark space and the star, is clear light. The places where it burns like that, then it becomes visible to us as if it were separate things. That's part of our misknowing. Clear light is all of that. that it's that, that, high, that level, it's supernova level of energy at all times. But it's very tricky because it's not super... You know, when you see supernova as an explosive and destructive thing, it's because you think of some difference, some movement, of, uh, differential movement of a concentration of energy exploding out into a place where there is no energy. And so that seems to be explosion. 
But this stuff never does that because it's infinite wherever it is, but always transparent. So, you know, and therefore I can, my hand is fully clear light and the space here with air in it is fully clear light. So I can move around and they're all clear light and it doesn't disturb itself. It's infinite. So it never gets in its own way. It doesn't do anything by itself. It doesn't create the world, actually. It, there is no, the world is uncreated. It's always been this absolutely quiescent but absolutely energetic thing. And a misknowing being can draw on it to create a nuclear explosion. It can draw on it to make it, like most incredible things out of it, which all seem then separate from it and based on a delusion of separateness initially. It's actually the basis and therefore in some sense never really happening, <laughs> only unreally happening or illusorily happily happening, okay? So that becomes then, it gets sort of where words are not adequate. I agree, I understand. So that's why I'm not saying you have to take whatever I say as a dogma, just to keep opening your mind beyond where you think you can close it. Oh, it's like this, or it's like, oh yeah, it's underneath there's all this infinite energy. No, this the surface is all this infinite energy. Surface and underneath and surface, it is all infinite energy. It's very quiet, so you don't notice it. And you are it, actually. <laughs> it doesn't move because everything is already done as far as it's concerned. But it is it's inexhaustibly present to any need, any differentiating need. So, clear light of the void, the peaceful, inexhaustibly vibrant, yet quiescent, so in a way, it's not really vibrant, but that's almost not true that it's vibrant. We are inexhaustibly vibrant when we get close to it, but it is completely quiescent energy plenum of emptiness or voidness. But it's not a trapped quiescent where any aspect of it couldn't move freely without depleting any other aspect of it to, by some delusory being who's feeling separate. which is not really foundational. Yeah, I say the matrix. Yeah, it's like a matrix. That's right. It's like a matrix. But it's a, it's a matrix where her, whether you're aware of it or not, it's still the matrix. You know, you don't have to, like, be kissed by Trinity, but maybe you do just in general, but, you know, to, to then suddenly discover it as if it was underlying. You, when, once you have discovered then it's there all the time simultaneously. Like, like Trinity, like Neo is able to function as a being in through the in the in the in the matrix and yet he's completely aware of the whole code of the matrix and so the the salt you know maybe matrix 5 will finally get into the core issues about the the seeming reality that seems to be outside the matrix that's the matrix in who is maintaining that matrix where the computers are doing to shield the planet from the radiation and so forth, and to keep it warm when there's no sunlight because of the huge cloud from the nuclear war or whatever it was that created the matrix. You know, what, what kind of matrix is that, in other words? And who's projecting that? Ha ha. All of us, actually, maybe. In other words, the Buddha fully experientially realized the nature of this reality with a non dual immersive consciousness. In a scientific sense, he was clear that it is inexpressible in words and cannot be captured by any positive final theory. It is the non-dual absolute, inexpressibly but utterly inseparable from the relative reality we normally associate with. It in, therefore, it enables us more to be more comprehensive, more sensitive, more fully capable and competent in associating with all of these things because we realize that we and they are equally interconnected. We're all equally clear light. Anything in between us is equally clear light. Associating or not associating is equally clear light. Therefore, we can associate only when it is beneficial. And we're never forced to. We're always free to choose not to. Because, we, because it, it is essential freedom. We're all the, all of us are same infinite clear light. We all have a reality body, same as Buddha, all the Buddhas. All past Buddhas and us are all one vast, clear light, final body, which coexists with all kinds of separated ones. Buddha voluntarily, us involuntarily, us non-Buddhas. That's really interesting. 
And even that, that shouldn't be a dogma. It will always be like that. But because it, it, in a way, it never will be like that because it isn't exist. It is uncreated. <laughs> in other words, in other words, when you know the inexpressibility, you can also get out of being stuck in any kind of one way or another kind of formulation. Using the one way or another formulations toward negation and openness and freedom, most skillfully at all, being then willing to go beyond merely a formulation. That's the great thing about a negation, the no elephant. It's just there is no no elephant, so it's not landing on anything. So it's just opening to what else is here? What else is happening? Freedom to be here. In a sign, in other words, he fully realized the nature of this reality with a non-dual immersive consciousness. In a scientific sense, he was clear that it is inexpressible in words and cannot be captured by any positivistic final theory. It is the non-dual absolute, inexpressibly but utterly inseparable from the relative reality we normally associate with. What I mean by relative reality is that an unknowing suffering being is one who experiences her, him, or itself as a separate limited entity surrounded by infinite other beings, things, and energies constantly threatening to overwhelm her, him, or it. Luckily, such an intolerable world is only illusory. Because, you know, if you're surrounded by infinite numbers of others who are like you but are absolutely separate and different from you, you're out of luck as far as being in control of things. <laughs> They're going to be in control of you. And uh, there will be negativity in that, for sure. And even the very prospect of it has negativity in it. An awakened Buddha being, I, that's the first noble truth, that the alienated being, misknowing alienated being, is bound to find suffering out of whatever it is, as long as they stay in that deluded state. An awakened Buddha being, accurately seeing through the illusion, and coming to know the reality of total bliss freedom is fully overjoyed by it. He or she or she he experiences her, him, or themselves as blissfully and invulnerably indivisible from the infinite whole of all beings and things and energies. From such an omnipresent, multifarious vantage point from all directions at once, so to speak, which is, of course, inconceivable, such a Buddha being can effortlessly shape her, him, or themselves to fit with what all those beings need to perceive in order to open doors for those beings' own deeper, enlightening experience. This is an inconceivable, wide-open worldview from which universal empathy and compassion become totally natural. Meaning, compassion simply is, it's like you don't say, even when, when, when I don't slap myself too hard because I feel the pain, so why would I inflict that on myself? So it's unbearable to me to slap myself too hard. Uh, and I don't think that's because I'm being compassionate to my leg or to myself. But that is, in a way, compassion. So when you are so empathetic with others that when they feel pain, even the inner angst, existential angst, of, you know, Weltschmerz, you know, uh, the suffering of life, you know, or something like depression, etc. You feel that completely. It's unbearable to you as if you were feeling it. So therefore, there's, you will be very skillful in helping them find their way out of it, even though you may not have power. You're not an aspirin pill. You, you could pray in the future, may I be a barrel of aspirin pills, if that's the best you can think of someone, just having that kind of palliative but when you become a Buddha, where you have many beings that you're empathetic with, limitless empathy over limitless beings, you will become limitlessly skillful in dealing with it, although not omnipotent, because omnipotent won't work. If you try to force a being to open to their oneness with all life, they will feel as if you're trying to depress them, oppress them squeeze them, they will resist you, and then they'll become in a greater state of tension than they already are with the other world. You, to, to, for them to open to find their connection to the highest bliss, uh, they have to be willing to do that. They have to be learned whatever it takes to be able to do that. 
and then you become, that's why you then the highest thing you can do is try to become some kind of a teacher or example, even if it's only by example of them. So, from the very beginning, Buddha taught this reality that he had discovered quite simply as the third noble truth or friendly fun fact of freedom from suffering, which he called nirvana, being blown away. So that's it was misunderstood for so long as meaning somehow, since people couldn't imagine life without suffering, they thought it meant to extinguish life. So they thought it meant it was a kind of death cult Buddhism, that you should just kill yourself. And then some modern people who even call themselves Buddhists, who are materialists, and who think the great thing will be to die and then you won't feel any pain and you won't worry about having lived or what went wrong when you lived, you'll be completely just simply returned to your true reality, which is non-existence, which is nothingness. Even though that is utterly irrational and utterly unevidenced, the one thing for which there is no evidence is nothing. <laughs> Nobody ever found it. It can't be found. It doesn't exist. It's a word for something that doesn't exist. So, so therefore, that's completely irrational, but never mind. It makes people feel better to feel safe from the consequences of how they've lived. But, and they thought that's what nirvana was, so they thought Buddha pre-discovered pre our, our non-existence, and then words like selflessness, soullessness, never mind noselessness, earlessness, eyelessness, lifelessness, deathlessness. Never mind all the more complicated ones, but the, 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 the lack of this and that, they thought it was the same, and it isn't. Nirvana is totally not nothing. Nirvana is everything as bliss. Even pain as bliss, but not in a masochistic way, only because the bliss is so exponential and so powerful, the release, and so simultaneous with even the experience of an agony, you know, in some sort of mechanical sense, it just totally overrides that pain. It doesn't just anesthetize, it overrides it. Which is inconceivable, isn't it? That, that total agony could be overridden by total bliss because of total bliss being so much more powerful. Because of its exponentiality, its unlimitedness, being cut, for example, or being stabbed or being crushed, it's only going toward a, it's a small, limited zone of the result. Whereas expanding and opening is, is, is beyond, beyond that. Okay. Anyway. So from the very, he taught that. He allowed people to, now he did allow people to understand this nirvana in whatever way was appropriate for them at a particular moment in their development. To some, he allowed them for the time being to think of it dualistically as referring to a place outside the world that they could reach by overcoming their egocentric ignorance and its attendant lust and hate. So that's, that's the, what's called dualistic Buddhism, uh, Theravada Buddhism, where they project that nirvana is a place outside the world because they cannot imagine the world of obstructed mutual obstruction of bumping into things and then bumping into you, and time being life and death and so on and rebirth and whatever, or, or they can't imagine that being blissful at the same time as experiencing it, where they've always experienced it as somehow unsatisfactory. So for them, it was necessary to think that there's, there's a place they can break free into it. There's a zone of pure freedom. And you can even have experiences like a zone, like you're in a zone of pure freedom, which when you have them, you will feel like it's the absolute. And then the problem is you return from that because since you are, you're exper experiencing things as a relational thing, you are, it's your relative experience of what you expect to be an absolute, the opposite of relative. And th but then that's not also exponential because it sort of wears out when, because it becomes a steady state and becomes like a being unconscious almost. So I'll talk, I can talk more about that when we get to the psychology of altered states. Uh, here is not the right place for that. But the point is that's not what it is. To others, he more precisely presented it non-dualistically 
as the reality of the here and now. So that fast spaciousness is right here. And it's not, it's not in the way of, though, the seeming obstructions of the things we relate to. But we can relate to them so much better when we're sort of, they surround us and we surround them and we are one with them if from in another, in a more overriding plane, which is the inconceivable tolerance of, no, of binary non-dualism, tolerance of cognitive dissonance state of enlightenment that we seek. And we find in ourselves, as we have it in ourselves, like you have it in the mirror image every day. So we already have it, but we have to really find it and figure out what it is and then realize how it can be expanded infinitely. He acknowledged right away that it is inconceivable and inexpressible, this reality of here and now being bliss, void, indivisible. So it cannot be embraced effectively merely as a dogma. Instead, the good news is that you can verify and experience such reality yourself. You can, you will, you, you can find it and, and, and strengthen it. That is just what the Buddha did. He engaged intensively in scientific exploration of the world, including within himself, and even primarily within himself. But that's, you find everything in yourself, too. So it includes the outside. It goes beyond inside and outside when you really look inside. When he finally experienced reality to the fullest, he exclaimed, wow, it is all blissful, uncreated, and absolutely free, and has been so always. I am it, and all of you are too. With that discovery, he knew that all of us can understand it too. He said, don't just believe me or believe in me without any reason. You must explore it all for yourself. Critique your own misknowing ignorance. Be sharp-minded. Doubt and investigate. Doubt what I say. Think it over deeply. You must seek it for yourself. And you also can discover the deepest reality yourself through a process of total education. Though you, because That's because everyone does have traction in actual reality. Somewhere deep inside, there's this open, openness of life to which the life force flows. Everyone has that. You couldn't stand, your cells would start rebelling one against another if you, if you didn't have that. And the more you don't be aware of it, the harder it will be to hold yourself together, actually, because you, 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 won't, you won't flow with the life force. The more open you are internally, then, this, then that ripples through your system where everything becomes open. And your natural, powerful, life force sensitive human structure is not a magnificent knowing and experiencing and feeling machine of the human being, body, speech, and mind, and you're not taking nearly advantage of it. Though you at first see it as inconceivable, you can bit by bit imagine it. You will get more and more used to its possibility, and its taste will lighten up your experience of the illusory, which will cheer you up. Just so, this is the founding of a tradition of joyful scientific discovery without a doubt. The process of education derived from it is based on the confidence that every human being can discover the very same thing for him or himself or herself or themselves, uh, many of them in one body, many of them in many bodies, one person in many bodies, that's also possible. <laughs> that's what Buddha does, has more than one body, in order to help more than one being at a time, okay, if necessary. The yak tail fly whisk teacher We'll, 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 we'll forge into this, although we won't have time to get all the way to the end. But we'll forge ahead, just a little more. About 15 minutes. I love the wonderful Chan Zen story from the Blue Cliff Record, Thomas and J.C. Cleary translation. I just love it. Thomas Cleary passed, the late Thomas Cleary passed away, but he was a junior colleague, student colleague of mine in Columbia. I mean, at Harvard, when we were getting our PhDs, and he became the greatest translator from Chinese and Japanese in, my, in his generation, sort of close to mine, I believe. 
and really outstripping everyone else, I really think. But academically also very sound. And um, uh, lost track of him toward the end, and he did pass away, sadly. But uh, really, truly great. And his Blue Cliff Record uh, translation is just outstanding that he did with his brother, one of his first major works. It is a story of the meeting of Bai Chang and his teacher, Master Ma, which Bai Chang told to his newly arrived, soon to be chief disciple, Huang Bo. Chan masters, the Chinese Zen masters, or Chan masters, used a yak tail fly whisk as an authority symbol. You know, they would whoosh around their fly whisk as a kind of like scepter or something. They would give a fly whisk to graduating disciples as a symbol of their having developed some level of understanding and therefore being kind of authorized to teach, teach others, to be of help to others. others. As Bai Chang told the story to Huang Bo, uh, he said, Now Master Ma asked me to pick up the fly whisk and then asked me, Do you identify with this or do you not identify with it? I answered by putting it back down. Master Ma then picked it up himself and then I asked him the same question. Do you identify with this or do you not identify? I asked him, my teacher, sort of give and take, student teacher in the Zen intense way, you know, where they've been meditating for days and weeks and months and years on these very things. Master Ma then picked it up himself and I asked him the same question. And then suddenly he made a lion's roar, a shout so loud that I couldn't hear anything else for three days. Like, rah, you know, like a huge roar. As he listened to this, completely open and empathetic, empathizing with the event, Huang Bo, because he was very open minded, you know, sensitive. And so his imagination was very powerful because it wasn't tied down on imagining the floor and uh, imagining the tip of his nose and all these things that we daily imagine, you know. So Huang Bo was so impressed that his jaw dropped and his tongue hung down out of his mouth in awe. You know, like we, uh, without realizing it, his tongue was hanging out, you know, thing, right? Which is a Tibetan, it's an Asian thing in general, but particularly Tibetan, it's like a sign of respect to go like that, stick out your tongue. Bai Zhang took note of Wang Bo's deep atta attainment, attunement, and said, because, you know, the, in the Chan tradition, the interaction between uh, master and disciple at a time when disciple has sort of reached the breakthrough enlightenment experience themselves, him or herself, is considered very intense. So every aspect of such an anecdote is itself a teaching. And so that's why it's so, so, in, there's so high level intensity. So then Bai Zhang says to Wang Bo, now that you have heard the great insight and seeing the great function of Master Ma. Don't you want to be my successor? He says. Because he's, you know, he, he realizes Huang Boy is destined to be his successor, actually, but now he wants him to accept it. Huang Bo right away said, no. <laughs> Continuing, I cannot just succeed to you. He who only equals his teacher's knowledge diminishes his teacher's virtue by half. Only he who transcends his teacher is worthy to carry on the tradition. The common day, end quote, that's what he said. I love that. Just amazing. The commentator on the text says here, that it's, you know, Chinese Chan commentator, you know, he says, to see how father and son behave in that house is to truly understand. And here, maybe if we have to need a little historical, sociological, the Chinese family, the fa father authority in the Chinese traditional family is very, very strong. So for the son to claim in any way equality with the father or even to surpass the father in any respect is considered shocking in the Chinese family structure. And yet in the Chan tradition there, in, in the supposed rigid Chinese culture that even today the silly Chinese Singapore and mainland China 
are running on and on about how dictatorship is natural to Chinese people and they love it and they should all be bossed around by some higher being in some authority structure, authoritarian structure, is belied by this massive tradition of Chan in China that was totally was a major thing there for centuries, you know, a millennium really, more than like 50, around 1,500 years. And still, even today, there's hundreds of thousands, hundreds of millions, I mean, Chinese who are still deeply into, it's suppressed by the communists, but they're deeply into Chan, you know. And so to see how father and son behave in that house is to truly understand is very, very deeply meaningful. Here you can see how true Chan and Zen maintain the inner heart of the progressive Buddhist science tradition. And this Chan example, of course, was in the context of the very patriarchal and authoritarian Chinese culture. Confucianism emphasizes the relationships of fa father, son, husband, wife, etc. And patriarchal authority is huge, as it was in India in Buddha's time as well. So that's really important, you know, uh, I was reading about how the Chinese are trying to pretend that democracy and free individual freedom is just a Western thing. Chinese people don't need that, and their own culture is basically authoritarian, and that's really great, and they really love it, and they're fine by it, says the boss, who is the authority. And actually, the people are not fine by it, actually. Otherwise, why would they have, for thousands of years, for almost 2,000 years, have completely welcomed Buddhism? which is anti-authoritarian to the max. Why would they have done so? Of course, Buddhism can be perverted and to be sort of condone or seeming to condone authoritarian thing, but not really, not in its educational heart, no way. Luckily, nowadays, sometimes the good teacher is the servant of the student. The key to is to practice this concept when exploring new territory or going over something again. Be the student with the beginner's mind, no matter how versed you may be in something. There is always something more to understand, and it is the students who bring fresh insight from their lives. They're the ones who do it. Such insight, the essence of genius, brings new knowledge to the teacher, who then becomes greater in the teaching of subsequent students. This is liberal education, and it is liberating educa liberal education in what's left of our our, our democratic culture and liberating education in the Buddhist educational system. The discussion at the, at the round table, liberating, not indoctrinating. Learning is not just the regurgitation of some fixed understanding. Understanding, look at even there's authoritarianism even in that word for insight or realization. Understanding, standing under some boss, you know. But never mind, we, we, it means aha to us, you know. But it consists of fresh discoveries that converge in a more realistic worldview. After the student reads what is assigned, you have an open discussion at a round table about the subject. It's the idea of equal intelligence as meeting. All are learning. In my own history, I have learned more in my role of teacher, many times more than as an official student from seeing things again and again in the light of the students looking at things afresh. I'm quite happy about adolescent rebelliousness, though it can be rough on us parents, because it encourages the young to break through and improve upon the stuck qualities of the old. The U.S. is such a fit place for it, since it can break through the conservative idea that each generation will be worse than the previous one, that we should perceive the old ways, preserve the old ways and traditions only, and that, we, we sh and that the young won't live up to the current generation, which we should not think that way. We should want them to go beyond us for sure. The Buddha himself rebelled as a young man. He left the palace he was raised in and his kingship and the Brahmin priest behind. He said to his father, the king, when he, Buddha, had his first son, which gave the father the license to abdicate and go on vacation, <laughs> go, to, go, to, go to Florida, go to an ashram, and leave his son to do the job of being the king. And then Buddha said, no, I will break away from all that. 
I can, and the, but he did it in the line of what he was taught, to, uh, trained to be a king, which means to serve his subjects, to, to protect them, take care of them, and so forth. And when he discovered that the subjects' real problems were death, sickness, aging, you know, and that there was a way beyond that by finding the real nature of all of those things, and there was a way beyond that suffering, when he felt he, had, he was not yet enlightened then as a prince, but he felt he could become so. So then he, he felt that would be a better way of protecting his people than just presiding over them like a judge and a commander-in-chief and, and an example. He says, no, I will break away from all that. I can understand things myself. You know, because the father told him, oh, well, you don't take care of people's deeper problems like death and sickness and so forth and grief and things. That's what the priests do. That's the job of the Brahmin priest. And that's what the gods are supposed to do. And Buddha said, well, the Brahm, the priests and the gods are not doing a good job because my, my people are too miserable and I think I can do better. That's, that's what he said. He had that intuition that he could. He didn't know it for sure, but he was going to darn well try. I can awaken and become enlightened. Then I can truly serve my people and make the world better and not worse. End quote. This fits with the American, can, quote, can do, can understand, can innovate kind of thinking, which, though sometimes co-opted by imperialist types, enables breakthrough after breakthrough. It explains our success on the planet as having the happiest people, basically, at least uh, up until today. Not complete because we haven't included everybody in it. We still have our native people and our enslaved people under, under us and the lower class people, so-called. We're still too caste-ish. Anyway, never mind. Having left his palace life behind for that of a scientist, the Buddha explored reality as it is and made many discoveries, cardinal among them being the reality of emptiness or selflessness. All things accepted in his day, such as the great god Brahma, the creator, so-called creator by those people at that time, and the various impersonal transcendent absolutes, he found them wanting in the sense that they all themselves are empty of any absoluteness, self-subsistent essence, intrinsic reality, intrinsic objectivity, or intrinsic identity. They all disappear under analysis that probes them to the core and finds no thing there. Indeed, it doesn't find nothing, but finds no thing there. <laughs> nothing not being a thing. Indeed, their emptiness itself, the freedom from fixed identity, is actually their only intrinsic identity. And that emptiness itself is also empty of its own intrinsic reality. So it's not a trap of a place outside of the relative world. It is the nature of the relative world. Thus everything is only relative, free of any absoluteness. Or you could also say it, put it like saying, its relativity is its absoluteness. Or its absoluteness is its inexorable relativity. You can put it all kind of ways like that. All of which bring you to cognitive dissonance and force you to recreate joy and life and open to life holding valiantly the tension between a cognitive the two cognitive dissonant things without letting them crush you into depression and becoming nihilistic and and yet without veering to one side or the other in a dogmatic exclusivist rigid ideology being truly fully joyously liberatedly open-minded. That's what it is. The Buddha shared the teachings on emptiness. Okay, well, I, I, will, I don't want to go on because it's been almost an hour. Well, I will just do one more thing. Yeah, the Buddha showed, the, shared the teachings on emptiness to free us from our habitual entrapment in supposed absolutes thus showing us how to develop a realistic worldview. As the great Indian poet Matar Cheta wrote in the 3rd century BCE, I'm sorry, CE, Buddhas, Buddhas do not bless away others' pains with hands, by laying on of hands, nor do they wash away others' sins with cleansing waters. 
They don't transmit their realization into others' minds. They free them by showing them their own reality. That's really great. So we'll leave it with that beautiful epigram. Buddhas do not bless away others' pain by laying on of hands. They did do a little bit of magical healing, but that's only minor. Nor do they wash away their sins with cleansing waters, nor do they try to pretend that by baptizing them they will do it, even though they do rituals and ceremonial initiations. They don't transmit their realization into others' minds. That is this whole thing that is somehow a little bit misemphasizingly translated as empowerment or initiation in esoteric Buddhism, in Tibetan Vajrayana Buddhism, you know, that people wrongly might think that the guru then just puts their mind into your mind. But that is not the case. They do not do that. They, because that would be an invasion of your mind. Whereas you have in your mind itself already a guru that you have to discover in there and bring forth. And somebody's imposing themselves in some sort of body snatching way is not it. But what the Buddhas do do for beings is they free them, liberate them, by showing them their own real reality, what is their own inner openness of mind and, and openness to the life force and feeling of health and vitality and bliss and joy that is our life force, okay? So we'll leave it there. We dedicate the merit. May we all quickly become as wise and free as Manjushri and joyful as Avalokiteshvara and you omnipresently goody-goody like Samantabhadra and to be, able to, us, to be able to help all other beings to be absolutely equal to us and to share in that bliss void, bliss freedom, indivisible, as soon as possible. Thank you very much. All the best. Okay, bye. Ding.